Over the last several weeks, we have been in this series we've been calling our vision series, this 4D, Church Beyond the Box. And we've been asking ourselves, what would it look like if we really got serious about following Jesus in 2015? And we've anchored our vision for this year in Ephesians chapter 3. And Ephesians chapter 3 is Paul's prayer for the church and it, Paul's prayer for us. That his deepest prayer for us is that we be able to understand the four-dimensional love of God. How God's love is wide and long and high and deep. And if God's love is in four dimensions, then God's love is going to move us in four dimensions. And so we've been, over the last several weeks, we've been talking about these four dimensions of God's love. And what does this mean for our church? If you've missed any of these, any of these messages, we have them online um, on our website, shilohumc.com, our Facebook page. You can check them out. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about what it means to move wider. And we uh, talked about evangelism and outreach and how the disciple Andrew was really our model of what it means to invite and to reach out to others, to think beyond the box, ask the question, who's not here and why? And then say, God, give me the courage to do something about it. Last week, we talked about what it means to move longer and uh, build a, a legacy that lives beyond myself, that matters beyond where, where it matters just to me. And so we talked about how to break generational curses, and we talked about how instead to be a church that gives generational blessings to all those around us. Today, we're talking about moving higher. And for me, higher is that worship and hospitality dimension. Now, I want to be clear, because I'm going to use the words worship and hospitality a lot that when I talk about worship and hospitality, I'm not just talking about showing up to church. And I'm not just talking about free coffee in the gathering space. I'm talking about a deeper principle. I want to challenge us to think deeper about worship and our role in worship and where does worship really take place and our role in hospitality. And what does that mean? Is it more than just passing out a bulletin or is it something deeper than that? In order to do that, I want to tell you a bit of a story. This is a true story that happened to my family and I um, about 18 years ago. I was 25 years old. I had just gotten my first job as a uh, full-time youth pastor. So this is my first full-time church job. And it was in a United Methodist Church. I'm not going to tell you which one. But uh, it was in a, a United Methodist Church. And so I was really excited about it because this was where I felt God was calling me. This is, God had been preparing me for this place. And so we'd been through the interview process, gotten the job. And, and so this was our very first week at church, at this church. And so the pastor said, sit up close to the front because during the sermon, I want to introduce you to the congregation. And so we did just that. We came into church about 15 minutes early because I'm neurotic that way and I have to be everywhere early. Any early people here? You know? oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm married to one who's not. Um, but uh, uh, so we got there early and we were like the only ones in worship. You ever get here and you think, wow, pastor talked about something they said during announcements. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear that. It's because you weren't here. Get here on time next week and you'll, you'll learn that. So anyway, we came in and we sat down in the third row on the left side of the, of the congregation and, and sat down and they, were, they had pews. And so we'd sat there and I sat right next to the end. And as we were sitting there, people began to come in and people were talking and music was playing and all that kind of stuff. And this guy came up and he stood right next to me at my pew and just stared at me. I just assumed maybe he wanted to introduce himself. So I reached my hand out to, to introduce myself. And I reached my hand out to shake his hand. And he didn't shake my hand. Instead, he looked at me and he said, You're sitting in my seat. <laughs> now, this was way before Big Bang Theory and Sheldon and all this kind of stuff. There, you know, I, I, you know, and I had heard urban legends about this kind of stuff happening in other churches, but I thought it was all some preacher made it up. Um, but this guy came and said, "You're sitting in my seat." And now you got to understand. Remember, I'm 25 years old. 
I'm a youth pastor at this time. So Brent, you know, everything's a game, right? Everything's a joke. Everything's fun. Every, you know, you're, and you're a youth pastor. Everything's just fun. And so you, you have a good time. And so I assumed he must be joking. I, I couldn't even imagine in my head that somebody would really walk into a church and say, you're sitting in my seat. And, you know, and so I couldn't even imagine that. So I assumed he must be joking. And so, uh, you know, I've, maybe somebody told him who I was. Maybe somebody told him, you know, he's just kind of messing with the new guy, you know, that type of thing. And so I, assuming that he's joking, should have said nothing. I did not do that. I wished I had. If I could go back, I would keep my mouth shut. But if you know me, you know that's probably not true either. What I said instead was, there's plenty of room. Would you like to sit on my lap? (laughs) (laughs) And remember, I thought he was joking. You know what they say about people who assume? So, he was not joking. He did not think I was funny. And he just stood there and stared at me like he wanted my head to explode. You know, just, you know, just trying to blow my head up. After about 30 of the world's most awkward seconds, uh, I eventually turned to my family and go, oh, this guy's for real. Hey, let's... So we slid down. We just slid down in the row. So now instead of sitting next to the aisle, I'm kind of sitting in the middle of the row, and everybody else has, has slid down. And I'd like to tell you that's the end of the story. That's where it ended, and I'm just this guy full of grace, never brought it up again, and it never became an issue. How many of you know me better than that, <laughs> right? Okay, so about 30 minutes into worship, the pastor gets up to... Uh, uh, to uh, preach, and he inter- begins introducing me, and, and he says, Dave, why don't you stand up? And so I stand up, and I'm thinking, oh, this guy's going to feel really bad, because now he didn't realize who I was. He didn't realize that, you know, I'm one of the pastors of this church now, and now he's going to feel really bad, and I wanted that. I wanted that. And so I stood up, and I kind of looked at him, and it was like it didn't even, it didn't even phase him. You know, I wanted him to go, oh, <gasps> You know, but he didn't. He just sat there, you know, like it was no big deal. And so I was like, huh. So then the pastor says, Dave, why don't you come up here and say a few words? Now, I had two options at this time. I could slide out the row in front of my family or... So I scooted out right in front of him. I'm like, excuse me, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me. I, I slid out right in front of him, and I go up there, and I just tell the congregation just how, how blessed my family and are to be part of such a welcoming congregation and how, how thankful we are to be a part of a church that places such a high priority on ministry and mission and, and hospitality and just looking so forward to serving with this congregation. And so I go back and I scoop back in front of him again and, and sit down. Now, I'm a jerk, aren't I? Now, honestly, I don't believe that Throughout that entire little altercation, I was fried about the whole thing. My whole worship experience, the rest of that day, gone. I, was, I gave him the power to ruin all of that. But I don't think it ever dawned on him that anything inappropriate may have just happened. I don't think it ever clicked in his head that there's another way to speak to somebody who's a first-time visitor to your church. I don't think it ever engaged in his psyche that, that that might not be, that this is my seat might not be the best attitude with which to step into worship. Worship, I believe, is the single most important thing we will ever do, we'll ever figure out. And it goes hand in hand with hospitality. Hospitality. You know, Jesus Jesus was asked one time in Luke chapter 10, what's the most important thing? Jesus, boil it all down, give me one liner. What's the most important thing? Remember what Jesus said? Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Worship. 
But then he couldn't stop there. He said, but you, you can't stop there because worship has this hand-in-hand relationship with hospitality. And so he went on to say, and love your neighbor as yourself. So I don't know where you are in worship, but I want to encourage you to tune in real tight today because this was a message that was really important to Jesus. And so it's a, probably something that ought to be pretty important to us as well. I want to encourage you to uh, grab a Bible and turn to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 100. Psalms is right in the middle of your Bible. You can't message, just open it up right to the middle. You should be pretty close. Psalm 100. And the book of Psalms is a fascinating book. I love this book because it's the best worship book you'll ever read. As a matter of fact, on your message maps and your bulletins, all the readings this week are from the book of Psalms because I wanted you to engage this book in a powerful way. But listen to what Psalm 100 says. It says, Shout for the joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Give Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. In this short five-verse psalm, I believe contains the heart of what worship and hospitality are really all about and what it ought to look like in a church. And so I want to spend a little time kind of dissecting this just a little bit. So verses one and two are kind of the how to worship. What should we do? It says, shout for joy to the Lord. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. So what we learn in here is that worship is a participation sport. You know, there ought to be some shouting. There ought to be some joy. There ought to be some gladness that happens in the process of worship. Now, I want you to hear me say, I get that not all of you are going to stand on your pew and, and, you know, and on your seats and, and yell at the top of your lungs. Not all of you are going to be my amen chorus in the middle of the sermon. Now, I, I get that. That's not who you are. I want to encourage you that worship, we are called to come into worship authentically, connecting with God in a real way, in whatever way that really makes the most sense to us. I just want to challenge us because my fear is that not all of us walk into worship authentically. I think some of us walk into worship thinking we got to play a role. You know, we're supposed to sing when it's singing time. We're supposed to pray when it's praying time. We're supposed to sit quietly when it's preaching time. And so we play this role and we never allow the, the emotional part of what worship is all about to engage us. And it's fascinating to me because I'll see the same guys who are quiet as church mice on Sunday morning be at Bengal Stadium on Sunday afternoon with their bodies painted, screaming their ever-loving heads out, right? You know, what, what is that all about? I think one of the reasons we struggle with how to worship is because we've, we've gotten into some role confusion. We're not sure whose role is whose. We're not sure what we are supposed to be doing while we're here and whose job worship really is anyway. So if you think of worship kind of like a play, you know, and sometimes that's the way we look at it. You know, there, that worship, if worship is like a play, there are really three key areas in every play. There's the audience, there's the actors, and there are the assistants, right? The, the audience are the people in the, in the seats. The actors are the people up on the stage. And the assistants are all the people behind the scenes making things happen, right? And so if you take that analogy to the church, here's how we often look at church. We often think that the people who are up here, uh, the musicians, the pastor, the, the scripture readers, everybody who's up here are the actors. And so we are putting on this, this play for you. We are performing worship for you. And, and so what, the role we relegate God to is the role of assistant. So it becomes God's job to kind of facilitate, bring your spirit into the room, kind of make sure things happen. And we pray ahead of time, God, if you let the sound system work and, you know, those types of things, you know. So we we ask God to be an assistant in worship. 
And so what that leaves is that our congregation then become the audience of worship. And when we do that, we become consumers. And here all of a sudden we start hearing things like, well, I didn't like worship today, or, or that wasn't my, really my thing, or that sermon didn't really speak to me, or maybe it's time to start looking for a new church, or, or whatever, because we've gotten this consumer understanding of worship. I want to offer you a, an alternative. What if we did worship a little differently? What if, rather than the congregation being the audience of worship, what if God was the audience? What if God was the one we worship? What if we read these words in Psalm 100 that say, shout to the, not congregation, shout to the Lord all things. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before the Lord with joyful songs. What if, what if God was the audience of worship? And what if the people here on this stage became the assistants? We become the facilitators. The, we're not going to steal worship from anybody, but we're going to try to create an atmosphere where, where worship can be accomplished. And what role does that leave you? Now the audience becomes the actors. You are the actors in worship. So when you show up on Sunday morning, when you engage in worship wherever you are, I want you to know that, that your role is not the audience role. God is the audience. You are the actors. We are called to bring forth praise, to be engaged in worship in some very real ways. It kind of changes everything about worship, doesn't it? Now it's no longer was I entertained. Now it's what do I have to offer? What am I bringing to the table? What do I have to give in worship? Because I'm the actor and it's on me. Look at verse 3 again. This is the why, why we worship. It says, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Now, in just this one verse, there are three reasons why we worship. And the very first one is that we worship simply because God is God. I should drop the mic, walk off stage, and be done. Because that's our reality. We worship because God is God. God, not because of what God can give us, not because of what God can do for us, not because we're trying to bribe God into something, not because we're trying to look holy to the people around us. We worship simply and solely because God is God. Know that the Lord is God. I had a friend of mine ask me a question one time that kind of wrecked my theology. So I'm going to ask you and see how, so good luck with that. Here's the question he asked. He said, if there were no heaven and hell, would God still be worth worshiping? If there were no heaven and hell. So in other words, if there wasn't this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, if I can just be good enough, maybe I'll get to get there someday. If there wasn't this thing I'm totally scared of trying to avoid on, on this side. If, there, if those extremes didn't matter, if it was just me and God, is God enough? I don't know where you are, but according to Psalm 100, know that the Lord is God. And we worship simply because God is God. Second thing, third verse says, is that because God created us, we worship. It says, it is he who made us. I get asked the question a lot, why, did, why would God create human beings? Well, you know, there's suffering, there's pain. Why would God do that? If God knew some people were going to choose heaven and some people were going to choose hell, why, why would God do that? Is God just some big egomaniac up there who needs people to worship him? Is he, is he that shallow? And I don't think that's the case. Where I've landed is, the Bible says God is love. And the most loving thing a being full of love can do is to create others who will share in that love. So you were not created to feed God's ego. You were not created to accomplish something God couldn't do all by himself. You were created to share in God's love. And because you were created, 
God is worth worshiping. The third thing it says is that we worship because we belong to God. We are not our own. We were bought with a price. We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. God owns all of it. Have you heard of the story of Job? Job in the Bible, it's a great read sometime. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky read, but it's a really important one. Job is the oldest book in the Old Testament. And the story goes that, Job, that God and Satan were having a conversation one day. I don't know if they were having afternoon tea or, you know, playing golf. I don't know what they were doing, but God and Satan were together. And God goes, hey, check out my man Job. That guy, he's got it. He gets it right. Man, that guy, he knows how to worship. And Satan goes, well, of course he does. You've given him everything. You've blessed him with family and money and, you know, power and influence. You've given him everything. Why wouldn't he worship you? And God goes, all right. Let's see. I give you permission to take all that away. You can't kill him, but take everything. And so the story is the, the systematic demolishing of everything Job had built over his life. His family, his money, his community, his friends, his health. Until at the end of this story, here is Job sitting on a pile of ashes, scraping boils on his skin with broken pottery. His friends are making fun of him. His wife has said, curse God and die. It is just as bad as it could ever get. And in Job 13, verse 15, it says, Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Even if God kills me, I'm still going to worship God. You know why? Because it's not about me. Worship is not about my circumstances. It's not about how I feel at the time. I'm not worshiping God because God has blessed me. I'm worshiping God because, because God is God. And at the end of the day, my circumstances do not dictate who God is. My circumstances, good or bad, do not define the limits of God's love. God is God, and God's love endures forever. And because of that, God is worthy of our worship. Verse 4 talks about the where of worship. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise and give thanks to him and praise his name. Now, a lot of times we, we look at worship like this. We, we, we come into us on Sunday morning and we're like, oh, man, it has been a heck of a week. I'm exhausted. My boss is riding me. My, my family's going crazy. Things are nuts. I need to get my tank full for the rest of the week, right? Some of you have said that. You, you know that language. You, you come in here to, to get your, your Holy Spirit high or whatever it, is your, whatever it is you call it. And the goal is to fill my tank to get me through the rest of the week. The problem is we try to go an entire week on one tank worth of gas. And there just isn't enough. To, to complicate that matter, there's been some research done recently about people who call themselves regular church attenders. If you would check that box, I regularly attend church. You know what the average amount of time people spend at a church who are, call themselves regular or church attenders is? 1.7 times a month. So there's been this gradual disconnecting from the church. People are coming less and less and hoping that their spiritual gas tank is going to last longer and longer. And so by the time you get here on Sunday, some of you are pushing the car into the parking lot. You're, it's, you're, you're so empty. You just need to get full again. And when you come in on empty, you got none to share. Right? What if we did this? What if we looked at worship a different way? What if we said this room wasn't the only place I can fill my tank? What if we came to realize that every time I connect with God, I'm connecting in worship? What if we took our message maps? What if we got on Right Now Media? What if we got a devotional book? What if we met with a small group? What if we engaged God on a regular daily basis so that every day I'm putting gas in the tank? Every single day 
I'm putting gas in the tank. And I'm not waiting until Sunday to come. And I'm ready for a crisis that hits. I'm, I'm in constant prayer. I'm in communication with God. And so when I walk in here on Sunday, I'm not counting on some musician or some preacher to fill my tank. I'm walking in on full. And when the Holy Spirit pours out, I'm just going to slosh around on everybody around me. Are you feeling me, church? This is what overflowing looks like. This is what abundant life looks like. Stop walking in here on empty. Some of you are empty, and I get that. I'm glad you're here. But you don't have to be. We can fill the tanks that God has given us in some very powerful ways. That's why the verse says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Notice it doesn't say walk in all grumpy and cranky and hope that God does something cool for you so you can walk out with thanksgiving. That happened. I'm, I'm guilty of that. I've, I've done that from time to time. But imagine how much better it would be if when we entered, we entered with the tanks full. Thanksgiving level on high. And now we're ready to share that with others. And so here's where this hospitality dimension comes in. Because if you're empty all the time, you got nothing to give. God's called us to fill our tanks so that we have something to give to others. Which brings us to this last verse, verse 5. It says, the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. See, what we're doing here is not just for us. I hope that you go home today and you think, man, God just really blessed me today. But I hope that you don't only say that. I hope that you say, you know what, God used me to bless somebody else. That I'm a part of what God is doing here. That those of us who have been called to be a part of God's family, we call Shiloh Church. Now that you're in, you're, you become hosts, right? You're the hosts. You're the ones who are keeping your eyes open for the, the loner, the one who's sitting by themselves, the one who's lost, the one who's hurting. That every person in this church is a part of the hospitality team. Not just a couple of folks who know how to make coffee. That it becomes all of our jobs because of who God is. And because of how we understand worship. We engage God and each other. Love the Lord your God. And love your neighbor as yourself. You can't separate those two. Last week I was at a meeting of pastors, and we got involved, and I got a ride. My car was in the shop, so I got a ride from a Korean pastor that I know here in this area. And we were talking, and, and I said, hey, can I get a ride from you? He said, sure, you can be my guest. And, and so I didn't know really what that meant. I just thought that was something you say. But to him, it meant a lot. To him, it meant that I didn't carry my bags to his car. He put my bags in his car. To him, it meant I didn't get out and scrape the windshield. He wanted to do that. And it was very important to him. He reminded me three different times, you're my guest. I'm your host. Imagine how different life would be if all of life, including our church time, was focused on others and not so much on ourselves. The vision flyer that's in your bulletin. There's a lot of ways we, we intend to engage in worship and hospitality in new and exciting ways here through Shiloh Church. Um, we want to raise the bar on attention to detail and worship because we know the people you will invite will come and they'll come one time. And we have one small window of opportunity to speak their language, to speak clearly to them. We want to really work on enhancing our communication systems, making sure that we're able to get you the information you need in order to be able to be, share the gospel and be the host that you're being called to be. I'm excited that uh, right now we have this new video camera that, that we are working on putting um, our messages online in high quality, high definition ways. Um, so that they can be available to, to folks online who can't make it here on a, on a regular basis. Um, we're going to invest in our serving teams. And, and there are just a number of things. But I want to share with you one that is most important to my heart. And that is prayer as a ministry. Hear me say that, church. Prayer as a ministry. Because I believe that at the end of the day, anything we do 
if it is not founded on prayer, if it is not fully bathed in prayer, if it is not committed to prayer, if we haven't prayed over it, then we are just rolling the dice. There's no power behind what we're doing. That prayer is what really makes a difference in the ministry as we follow Jesus. And so this year, I'm looking for some passionate people about prayer. I'm looking to gather some folks and develop prayer teams and, and develop a prayer ministry here in this church that, that undergirds and bathes everything we do in prayer. Because at the end of the day, church, we can put on a show, but it's not worship until God shows up. And God shows up in prayer. And so as I speak those words about prayer, if there's something resonating in your heart, I want to talk to you. I want to know who you are. I want to connect you uh, with some others who are like you. And I want to begin to build this ministry, this critical part of who we are. I want to close with this one last thing. I want to invite the band to come on back up as we, as we end. In, uh, in England, there's this church. A guy named Matt Redman is the worship leader there. Matt Redman is, you know, most of the songs we do, Matt Redman either wrote or influenced. He was one of the early pioneers in contemporary Christian music, and his church became known as the church where great music happens. Okay, that's worldwide. People would come from all over the world to study their music and to try to replicate and duplicate their music, and it was, it's fabulous. But what they began to realize was that the people at his church, even though the music was amazing and it was godly and it was spiritual, they were worshiping worship and not God. They were worshiping the music and the style and not God. And so Matt and the pastor began, made a courageous decision that for an extended period of time, the sound system went away. They unplugged everything. No instruments, no guitars, no, no speakers, nothing. They unplugged it all. Because they didn't want people to lose what worship was really all about. And so they found other ways to connect to God. They, they would pray and they would read God's word and they would gather together in community. And they found other ways to connect to worship. And after that extended period of time was over, Matt Redman wrote a song that you may be familiar with. The words are these. When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that'll bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. And here's the promise. He says, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Because it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus.